Hey everyone, this is Nico Ernstow from the Centron Foundation, and in this video we're going to keep looking at smart items and seeing how we can use them to make our scenes more interactive and more fun. So in the previous video we added some simple smart items and left them without configuring anything about them. We just used them out of the box. We added these doors, this chest, this platform, and they're good enough as they are. Like we, we can configure them in different ways and there's a lot of interesting use cases for changing that default behavior. But in some cases, at least, they're good enough as they are. But that's not the case for some items where sometimes like, they would require some minimum configuration. And for example, that's case, the case for buttons. Um, buttons are, you know, they, they come with some default behavior, um, but you're kind of going to expect them to activate something else. You don't just expect a button to be pushed for the sake of it. And the same happens with levers. Um, again, levers will also like respond to, to clicks and they will, you know, switch over from one position to the other. But as a player, you're surely going to expect them to really activate something else. But let's, let's look at the preview and see what they look like in action without doing anything other than just dragging them into my scene. So if I walk up to, up to my button and I click on it, let's first use the first person view. Um, you'll notice that it does play a little animation and it plays a sound. And that's it. Like I, I'm now going to see how we can make it, you know, actually trigger something like, for example, this door. Um, and the same applies to this lever. It plays an animation and it plays a sound. Um, and it switches between two positions. I got to click on it twice. That's a big, the big difference between buttons and levers is that buttons only have one different um, trigger um, condition and um, levers have two. So now let's look at how we can make these, um, these, this button and this lever actually activate the door. But before we do, let's look at the properties that every single item has. Because we're going to set this by changing the properties here on the right. But let's first understand like the basic set of properties that every single item in my scene has before we dive into the more advanced ones. So if I take any item in my scene, you'll notice that it has a certain list of properties that are grouped into a transform component and a GLTF component. These are simply places where we group different properties about this item. Now the transform component is by far the most common one and it's present in pretty much every single item you might find in a scene. And it tells you the position, the scale and the rotation of that item. Um, so, for example, if I were to move the item around, you'll notice that the values here on the position are changing, um, referring to the position of the item in my scene. Here I'm raising it on the y-axis, and I can also change things like from here, from the menu. I can set this back to zero, so that's back on the floor. Um, I can, for example, um, change the rotation to 90 if I don't want to you know, just rotate it manually. Um, I can even change the scale. I can you know, change the scale in just one axis if I want. I can set it to 2 here, 2, and 2. And this is you know, stupidly large, but yeah, I'll set it back to 1 just for, so that it's less, less terrifying. Um, the other thing that I can change, and that the other thing that is present in every single um, item in my scene, smart or not, is a GLTF component. And this basically tells me what 3D model to load in this position. So with the transform, we're telling us where to load something and with what rotation, what size. But with this, we're telling us what exactly it is we're loading. And it's always going to be a, either a .glb or a .gltf file, and it's under a specific path. Um, you'll see that as I drag things into my scene, that different files get added to my file, my, my you know, projects folders. And these, these paths here refer to these paths that you can find here. And what's interesting is that I can, you know, I can even change um, the path of one 3D model to another. For example, if I take this, this weird dead fine, I can change it for whatever I want. For example, I can change it for this blue acacia tree here. If I drag the GLB file over here, suddenly my dead fine became a living tree. Um, and note that, for example, the, the scale has not changed. The scale is still one. And really, that's because the scale is a multiplier of the original scale by something else. Like even these little vine thingies that are you know, a lot smaller, they also have a scale of one. That's because the original file um, of the 3D model 
has this shape and this size. We're just not multiplying that by anything to, to make it any bigger. So let's come back to our smart items. You'll see that all smart items have those same two components as well, the GLTF and the transform, but they also have more components and there's where the smart part comes into. Um, almost all smart items will have these two components, the action component and the trigger component. Now the action component is about listing what things the item is capable of doing. And it's going to tell me that this item can do a list of things, but then the trigger component is about telling me when we want those actions to be carried out. It triggers those actions into happening whenever certain trigger events happen. So in the case of the button, um, you'll see that there are two actions inside the action component. Um, one action is called playing activate animation and it plays an animation that is named trigger in this case. Um, and this is the animation that we're seeing when we click on the button. It's that um, little pushing animation that you see there. And the other action that this um, item has is the play sound action. And this one is referring to a sound.mp3 file that is also part of the files in the scene. And that is a sound that you hear when we click on the button. And you'll see that it's also configured to play once and that it's set to a volume of 100. And I could change that. I could make it less loud if I want or even refer to a completely different sound if I wanted to. Um, so as I mentioned before, the actions component is about telling me what things are possible to do, but it doesn't tell me when these things happen. And that's the job of the trigger component. The trigger component tells me that whenever I click on the entity, I'm going to activate those two actions. I'm going to activate the play animation action and the play sound action. And that is how we achieve the um, this that we're seeing here. Um, that is how clicking on the item makes the item play the animation and play the sound. Now, where this gets a lot more fun is um, that we can click on this plus sign and add more actions to this list. And what's even more fun is that I'm not limited to only call the actions on this same and I item here, like this item has, you know, these two actions that I mentioned before, but I can really call any action on any other smart item in my scene. So instead of selecting the black button, which is itself, I can select the door or the chest or whatever else I want in the scene. So for example, I can select the door and call the open action, or I could instead call, you know, the fantasy chest and call the open action in the fantasy chest. And with that, I I'm already triggering the item um, as you would expect. Like the button would already be calling something into action. Um, by the way, notice that I have two doors in the scene and when I drag them in by default, they both were not named just wooden door. It's a good practice to um, rename them just so that you know which one you're pointing at. So if I click here, the right button and click rename, I can change the name to whatever makes sense to me, whatever is more um, you know, memorable so that when I am selecting, so I'm selecting the item from the list, I don't, you know, run into a scenario where I have two things called wooden door and don't know which, which one is which. Anyway, with this, we already have what we were trying to build working. So I'm up opening a new preview here and you'll see that I can click on the door. Uh, I can click on the button to open the door. So now if I come up to my button, there's three things happening. I'm seeing the, the animation of the button, I'm hearing the, the button, and I'm also seeing the door being open. Great. So now let's look at the lever. The lever is slightly more complicated because as I mentioned, it has two different, um, two different um, yeah, trigger actions. Um, so it goes from one side to the other, and you can map those two actions going from one side or going to the other side um, as two different um, trigger events. And so in this case, the default configuration of the, of the lever has two trigger events, one which is um, on click and that has a condition. We're gonna, not going to dive into conditions in this video, but just know that in one case, um, this is what happens when the, um, the lever is deactivated. And on the other condition, which is all, like on the other, sorry, another trigger event, we have another condition where the lever um, is activated. So when the lever is um, deactivated, I want to add another action and make the door get open. 
and when the lever is already activated i want to add another action and make the door get closed um, and so with that i would be able to um, yeah make my lever also open and close my door so let's close this one So now if I click on my lever, the door gets open, and if I click on it again, the door closes. And also the button still acts up on the door, and the door itself is also activatable. Um, so yeah, on the next video we're going to see how we can also change that so that the door can't be opened by clicking on it, and that it can only be opened by the button or the lever, which is probably a lot more interesting as, you know, as a game design kind of thing, because maybe there's a bit of a challenge to finding where the lever is, etc. Um, the last item I'm going to show in this video is the trigger area smart item. And this is an item that can also trigger other items. Um, but the, the whole point of it is that it triggers them whenever the player steps inside the area of the item. Um, so this item is invisible, by the way. So if you look at the, at the components that it has, you'll notice that um, it has a GLDF component as always, it has a transform component as always, but also has a visibility component. And what this does is it makes it invisible when I actually run the scene as a player. Right now I'm seeing this orange cube, which is helpful for me as a content creator because I'm seeing where this area is and I can use this to also, you know, stretch it out or move it to wherever I find convenient. But the player will not be seeing this orange cube, the player would be seeing nothing in its place and would only be finding out when they step on the area and they see things being activated. And also that's why this item doesn't have an actions component as well, because it doesn't do any actions of its own. It doesn't animate or play any sound. It just is there to trigger other items. So if I look at the trigger, um, the trigger component, we'll see that there's two different trigger events. Um, one is called when the player enters the area and the other is called when the player leaves the area. So in this case, when we enter the area, let's make the chest run the open action. And when the player leaves the area, let's make that same chest run the close action. So with this, the chest should open as soon as I stand in front of it. So now if I go inside and I stand in front of the chest, it opens. If I leave, it closes. So great, that's all I wanted to show in this video. Um, stay tuned for more videos and we'll dig in even deeper and you'll see that this rabbit hole goes pretty deep. Uh, so thanks for watching and stay tuned.